Welcome to Real Estate Investing Abundance, the show for busy, fulfilled professionals like you to learn how to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. Now, here is your host, Dr. Alan Lomax. Hello, enlightened investors. Welcome back to the show. Delighted to be with you once again today. And we're going to take a look at maximizing your property management relationships, an important aspect of real estate investing, to be sure. Luke Lyons oversees third-party management growth and expansion in Florida and the Carolinas for ResProp Management, a vertically integrated owner-operator turned fee manager. Luke's background includes development acquisitions, private equity raising, and third-party property management. So Luke, share an experience that helped you to be who you are today. Hey, Alan, thanks for having me. I would say my first big experience that kind of got me moving on the path to business was when I was maybe 12 or 13 years old. Uh, so the early 2000s, this new website showed up called eBay. So I, I started using eBay and then we'd buy things once in a while. And then I thought, hey, if my parents aren't using something, maybe they'll let me sell it for them. So I started buying and selling on eBay. And again, I think I was 12 or 13 years old. And then I was at a, I was at a high school football game at a tailgate and I was call it 15. And a gentleman came up and put a big sign in front of where we were tailgating in front of the game. We couldn't see anymore. So I walked up and I said, Hey man, what are you doing? And it was a, it was for an eBay store. So my, my dad actually was like, Hey, you should go talk to this guy and present that you have some skills that he might appreciate. Now, granted, I'm 15 years old. And I said, why, why would this guy be interested in having a 15 year old come to work for him? And I went and talked to him and said, Hey, I've done this and this on eBay. I take my own pictures. I write my own listings. I've done relatively well. Moving, moving products on eBay. And sure enough, he was like, hey, come, come work for me at my store as many hours as you want. So I, I got to work at the store. And it, it was that age that I realized uh, success is, is the province of people who are willing to be experts and put in the work. And, and nothing disqualifies you from that. There's nothing that disqualifies you based on age, or where you came from with regard to what you're able to do. It's really just focusing your time and attention on, on gaining that skill and, and then having the courage to offer it to other people and say, hey, I can help you by doing this. So that that happened at a pretty young age for me, and it, it's been great for me throughout my career. Yeah, what an experience. Great and affirming way to start off with any endeavor there. Yeah, absolutely. It's great that your dad took the initiative to say, uh, reach out to this fellow. Yeah, absolutely. And encourage you in that direction. Luke, tell us about the processes of selecting a property manager. How do we go about that? And what are we looking for when we're looking for a property manager? Yeah, great question. And then this is something that I commonly talk about because it's oftentimes overlooked. So in Florida markets, we'll get calls from a broker on a, on a, on a deal they've listed. And they'll say, hey, Luke, we've got this group. They won this property. They're, they're under contract. They're wondering what they should do with regard to a property management relationship, who they should use. And that, that always throws me off because our company, having been an owner and then been vertically integrated, we've always leaned upon our operators. And then now that we're working with non-integrated third-party groups, we've been so involved in the front-end process. But it always, it always blows my mind that you're even able to, with conviction, purchase a deal in a market that you don't live in, that you haven't operated in without consulting someone who spent time there. So the first thing I always say is, as you enter new markets, as you start even thinking, hey, I want to go to Charlotte, North Carolina. The first thing you, you want to do is figure out who's there, right? Everyone's figuring out who the brokers are, right? Who's the broker? Who's going to be listing deals that I'm going to be buying? But the immediate next step should be, hey, who's who's operating this market? Who would be incentivized in order to grow to help me to understand the market, understand which deals they do and do not like, help me underwrite deals, provide market summaries, market feedback, market surveys. A lot of groups are doing it. It's 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 a relatively new phenomenon in the industry, I would say five years old or less, that it's almost an expectation that property management companies provide a an operating pro forma to buyers. This this didn't really exist eight, 10 years ago. And you could call up the property manager and say, hey, will you do the work for me? Provide me a pro forma. Now, now it's almost an expectation. So when you're looking at a deal, you can actually call up property management companies and ask them, hey, can you help me to write a pro forma? And then you can compare your pro forma with theirs, with another management shop. And all it is is free information. How much do people cost in this market? Where do they expect rents to go? How much do they expect uh, you know, new cabinet fronts, paint, resurface, stainless appliances, fixtures, bathroom renovation to cost? And then on a granular level, is that more or less than other markets I've been in? So 
there's there's just this wealth of knowledge that sits in these in these companies that that I really don't think is being leveraged as much as it should. When if you if you're getting to a deal and you're you're actively bidding on a deal without talking to somebody, gosh, we more often we've had so many times when somebody calls and they said, hey, we're looking at this deal. We used to own it, or someone we know used to own it. We can walk through kind of step by step the history of this property. And that may be a good thing. And we may say, hey, we think that this property is kind of the upside is a little maxed out. So this might not be the deal for you wanting to go into a heavy value add player. Or there's a there's an AMI cap in this market. So it, it, it just seems like a lot of people are, are, there's this easy button of engage your resources in a market that not everyone is pressing. So I always encourage people to reach out, find the managers and really, really see what they have to offer you. In terms of single family property managers, it's fairly easy to just go to Google and you'll find uh, lots of uh, realtors in the area that are offering property management services. It's not quite that easy to find a commercial property manager. How do we find qualified property managers in the commercial side? Yeah, great question. Part of this process is getting to know your resources, getting to know brokers and help brokers to understand that you're a legitimate buyer who's really interested in the market is very important. So most most brokers know who's out there. So it's always good to, to ask these brokers as you're looking at property, say, hey, I'd like some additional opinions on this. Can you list off five operators, property managers in your market that you've seen growing or that you've, you know, who have approached you saying, hey, we're trying to grow, we're doing something innovative and new. So your, your best resource is that broker since you're hopefully interacting with them already. Beyond that, if, if you're looking at a property, you look at the comp set, you jump on their website. And if you scroll to the very bottom of the website of 90% of properties, there'll be a logo for who the operator is, who the property manager is on that property. And you can start getting a feel for, hey, I like this website. I, I noticed that this property seems to be sitting at the top of the 80s value add comp set in this tight radius market. Who manages that property? They seem to be doing well. On the flip side, you might see properties that are lagging. Their, their marketing is not strong. Their, their occupancy is high. The name on the bottom of that website, hey, maybe I'm not going to I'm not gonna steer myself toward that group. So there, there's a lot to be learned just from snooping around comp sets. Well, thank you for that information, Luke. You mentioned to utilizing property management on the front end and how valuable that can be. What are some other ways and means that investors can add value to their properties through the use of their property managers? Yeah, on the ownership side, you're not spending a whole lot of time piloting processes, piloting technology. Keep keeping in mind that, that property management companies, most, you know, after a certain scale, they actually have innovation departments who are piloting new technologies, new processes. We stood up an outsourced assistant property manager role recently, kind of in COVID, to kind of take some of the burden off of that W2 site staff and, and allocate it to a kind of a more process-driven team. So there, there's always something innovative happening. So the, the best thing you can do is as you're, again, you might be working with one property manager, it might be a few in different markets, whoever has scale or is strong in that market, or you brought a manager with you to a new market. Just asking from time to time, hey, what are you seeing? What's new to the industry? What do you see that's interesting? You know, be it virtual leasing or a new vendor that's come on that's driving a lot of traffic on the marketing side. But just just asking, you know, what what are you seeing? What have you what have you learned? Is there anything you're seeing market wise? Again, if you're looking at a market, if you're in Charleston and you ask your property manager who lives in Charleston, has probably been in Charleston for a while. Hey, what's what's going on? What's exciting in your city? Oh, well, there's this new multi-use development going in here. Well, that might get you interested and in say, oh, if there's this great development coming in 2024, 2025, maybe I should tighten up my net a little bit and be looking specifically for properties in this area. So it's just a, an information source. And again, the property management industry is becoming very commoditized. So there's this race to providing good solutions and good high yield technology. So it's always good to ask, what is your company doing differently? What's on the horizon for you? Are you innovating, trying to innovate, or are you just really tight in the traditional process? And there's always something to learn having that conversation. We're mentioning technology, Luke. It, it is amazing to me the transformation that has occurred in the last five years within property management. And like you had mentioned, there's just new technologies coming on all the time. But the technologies that have been coming forward in the last five years have really truly been innovative and have changed how it is that property managers interact with tenants, not only the current tenants, but with prospective tenants. You mentioned virtual leasing and different things that just didn't exist five years ago. And then also there is that the aspect of electronic Locks, those, I mean, those have been probably available for the last 10 years, but they were hardly ever used and they're just becoming 
almost the norm these days, just like they are uh, in hotels and motels. So the, the changes have just been tremendous in terms of technologies. And I can understand why you would suggest contacting property managers to to help stay on top of that, because it's just impossible to stay on top of it unless it is your primary aspect and primary job there. Yeah, absolutely. Luke, you say that underwriting has changed considerably since COVID. How has it changed? What was the cause of the change? Yeah, yeah. So we all remember spring, summer 2020 when the market kind of froze up. And then from that point forward, we've been seeing a, lo- a lot of movement in underwriting. And, and probably probably the biggest thing that we've seen is expenses ballooning on properties. So uh, lumber went up to like six, seven bucks from a dollar. And yet lenders and investors didn't adapt in the way they were in the, in, the, in the CapEx they were allocating for unit terms or club or clubhouse remodels. A lot of people stopped working. There was a big influx of cash that came into the market. A lot of people stopped working. And then this minimum wage staffing crisis started pushing up into the high teens, low 20s payroll numbers. So it became so hard to staff good people, people, period, let alone good people on these sites with the old adage of staffing should be. 10500 to 12000 $10,050 to 12050 dollars a unit, whatever it is. Now it's suddenly ballooned and underwriting expectations didn't move. Lenders didn't change. Investors didn't change. They were looking at this. Delinquency became something that groups weren't used to looking into, right? If, you, if, you, if you're underwriting a property, and we always ask groups, we say, hey, can you get your hands on a major receivables report? Can we see who these ballooning of all these non-paying tenants from really mid 2020, late 2020 until today, they're they, you know, still some still exist. Can we get our hands on that? And can we accurately underwrite delinquency, bad debt write-offs in the beginning of this whole period? Yeah, things just materially changed. And and again, it's really hard to understand and, and adapt to those things. As let's say I'm living in Chicago and I'm trying to buy a deal in Texas. I don't know how the, the staffing market in Austin has moved. Austin's unemployment is effectively negative, right? So I don't know what I can get a leasing agent for, a, a supervisor on my property. Some supervisors are asking for 40 bucks an hour in Austin. And if you're underwriting $22 an hour and you, you know the deal pencils, but it's tight because everything has been tight, you can get yourself in a real hole. So ad- adjusting to those expectations, you know, we've still got groups slapping in 6,000 bucks a unit for renovations. It's like, if you can get the materials, the labor is going to be a lot more expensive. And those materials you are getting are going to be a lot more expensive. So we're always trying to inform. Not everyone is happy. Not everyone's always happy about it, right? And hearing Oh, that that six thousand dollar mid range renovation is now ninety five hundred bucks. Well, it used to cost us a few hundred dollars for the labor, and now that labor on a per unit is like eighteen hundred bucks. It's gone up exponentially. The, the, the lumber used, so the stone, if you can find it, right? Appliances, if you can find them, have increased by a lot. And and so mm-hmm. and so we're always we're always trying to inform. So yeah, under, underwriting has certainly moved, and we've gotten very comfortable with these with these high rent bumps on renovations, which still exist, but it's it's not a blanket win. With, with regard to renovations, you have to really look at the market, really look at the comp set, and then be a little more sophisticated when you're underwriting that renovation. It's interesting, though, that during this whole period of time, expenses were ballooning, delinquencies were increasing, and yet cap rates were uh, compressing and, of course, prices increasing, and the markets became extraordinarily, extraordinarily competitive. Just in your estimation, what do you think is going to happen here in the future with as you were indicating, many of these people were really not taking these things into consideration in their underwriting. The lenders weren't really taking that into consideration. And now all of a sudden, these markets are, are shifting, interest rates increasing. What's going to happen with all of these people who really were not accurately underwriting? Yeah, you know, it's funny. For, for, for years, the market bailed a lot of people out, right? Who'd have thought in 2019 that cap rates would further compress Another gosh, what were rates in twenty? Another point, point and a half from twenty nineteen to twenty twenty. Really, fall twenty twenty one, spring twenty twenty two was when we seemed to hit that low. Rate rates mm-hmm. were at low, and then you know, looking at I live here in Bradenton, Florida. Bradenton, Sarasota rents increased. Market rents increased fifty two percent year over wow. year. Mm-hmm. So these incredible bumps due to largely a lot of saving, right? The single balance sheets have gone up. The, the family balance sheet has gone up. So rents have been absorbed and no one wanted to move for a while. Now, the big question is, yeah, rates are rates are going up. From a whole period perspective, we're not seeing markets soften too much. We're seeing in the markets that most people have been buying, which have been high in migration, growth, job story markets. We haven't seen a whole lot of softening 
In fact, we're assuming that it's going to be far more difficult to, to buy a home with a, with a 7% rate. So the cost of home ownership is increasing. So that typically bodes well for multifamily rentals. Now, the R word recession coming in and mixing things up. If, if you've already got the deal and, and you hopefully you have rate caps, you're, you're probably going to be okay. Well, the big question is how quickly those who are looking to build their portfolios, how quickly deals start penciling again. So we're already seeing, I'm sure you've seen, we're probably seeing 5 to 10% of the deal transaction volume that we saw three months ago, six months ago, largely due to Fed insecurity, right? Not knowing, is this is this bump going to be you know, 100 basis points? Generally, I think soon as we get some clarity around that, I think the market's going to pick that up. Multifamily P&Ls are still really strong. We, we we expect them to remain so. It's really how do you deal with, with these rates when, when cap rates are still high. I just had an email from a guy, in, in a broker in this market. They're listing a deal. It's it's still at a 375 cap rate. I asked, how would a group buy this buy this property from you with rates where they are? And I think that's the big question. And guys who bought on these adjustable rates, on these floating rate loans, might run into a little bit of discomfort. But really, we're, you know, we're operating in Florida, Texas, and the Carolinas right now. These are not markets we expect to soften. Now, I think... There, there will be some markets that, that slow down a little bit. But again, I think your informed buyer wasn't buying in those markets in the first place. We're still feeling really good about things. I just think it's going to be really difficult for the next, next six months for anyone to grow their portfolio. Luke, share with our enlightened investors what it is you have to offer and how it is they can take advantage of that. Yeah, definitely. So we are uh, risk prop management. We are a property management company. So we were one of the larger investment companies in the state of Florida from 2010 to 2019. And in 2019, we decided that we wanted to kind of shift our focus to where we thought innovation was going to be most impactful in multifamily, which was in the weeds, in the day-to-day, in the property management, what's happening on site and in those in those property management support offices. So we, we shifted our head. We stopped acquiring. We dispoed a, a large percentage of our portfolio and moved into third-party property management. Since then, we've grown to about 11,000 units in Florida, Texas, and the Carolinas. And again, we've, we've kept our deal blood, our investment shop blood. So we work with a lot of newer investors. We work with a lot of mid-size investors from New York, the Midwest, California, who want those boots on the ground, that local expertise. So really, we want to get involved and help good good ownership groups get a hold of good properties and in, in, in great markets. So we, we always get super involved in the front end of deals, offer what resources we can, and hopefully that leads to a, to a professional relationship uh, once, once groups start buying deals. So yeah, that's, that's what we do. Luke, how do we go about selecting the markets to invest in? Yeah, really good question. I, I spend a lot of time thinking about this. There's been a lot going on. And again, like, I always, I always say start at the, the most macro level you can, which I guess is the United States is a pretty good multifamily market because it's one of few mul- true multifamily markets in the world. From there, you're probably going like regionally and, and to states. So a lot has happened. And I won't, I won't say too much about this, but a lot has happened politically over the last few years that's driven a lot of migration, individual migration and economic business migration. So I always start there and look where businesses are moving and what people are interested in. I'm always watching news, news stories. Like, uh, I, don't know if you, I just read an article. An, an incredible number of people have moved to Bozeman, Montana because of a TV show, Yellow Yellowstone. There's all these, there's these cultural inputs as well. So you, it's just being out there, keeping a pulse on things, you know, not just metrics, but how people are feeling. Are people enjoying? I'm, I'm from Denver, which experienced an incredible population boom from 2014 to 2020. And then, then it kind of shifted from Denver being the hotspot and then, and then Boise, Salt Lake, and the Southeast kind of took over. You could see some signs of that happening in 2018, 19, before COVID. And then when COVID hit, it was only extrapolated. So just, just keeping a pulse on where people are moving, where they're going is helpful. And then, and then follow sales, just getting a feel for, for tax burdens and, and for total cost of ownership or price per pound on the acquisition. There are, there are still some markets in the Southeast that are, are, are being somewhat overlooked transactionally because they're historically considered kind of not, not attractive markets, but you, you're getting an incredible amount of immigration. They're very tax-friendly states. They're attractive to people. So yeah, just, just keeping an ear to the ground. And I would say right now, I'm more bullish on the Southeast than probably anywhere in the country. And I, I think it'll continue to be that way for another five to 10 years. Are there any sources that you recommend for helping to keep our ear to the ground. Yeah, you know, the, all the business journals we subscribe to. Another reason to have a, have relationships in the brokerage community in the management industry is CoStar and Yardy Matrix put out really, really great market reports. Not many people 
leverage these economic and market reports that CoStar and Yardy Matrix put out. Every quarter, they're putting out phenomenally good data from the nationwide level to, to regional, to state, to market, to tight submarket. Probably, probably most of their expense goes toward writing good data for these reports. So it's as easy as on a quarterly basis, reaching out to your contacts who, who have access to CoStar and say, hey, would you be able to share some of this information with me? And then again, really, you know, keeping a pulse on, again, like I, I think I think there are things to be learning from, from politics, going to Secretary of State websites and seeing how many businesses are registering in cities, in states that, that you think might be growing. This, this has been huge. You know, if you look at Austin, there are however many hundreds of businesses registering in Austin weekly, daily, whatever it is. That's bringing people, that's bringing money, probably a pretty good market to keep looking at. And Austin is, has arrived, right? But, but there are other smaller markets that have a very similar trajectory. Right. Well, Luke, it's been wonderful having you today, Enlightened Investors. It's been an informative session, different look at investing from the property management perspective, which we don't always have on this show. So I appreciate you being with us today, Luke. Enlightened Investors, I look forward to being with you next time. And Luke, thank you for being with us. Alan, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for tuning in to Real Estate Investing Abundance, brought to you by Steed Talker Capital, a company working for passionate professionals like you to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. As part of our efforts to make the world a better place, Steed Talker Capital contributes to activities and organizations committed to better understand the equine. These endeavors attempt to enhance the human treatment of horses worldwide. Steed Talker Capital, working for a world where all creatures, great and small, flourish abundantly. For resources to develop your financial independence, connect with us at steedtalker.com.